So, hi everybody, welcome to another Alan Carroll's world famous podcast of life's podcast. And uh, this week we have somebody really interesting on the podcast, and it's a lady called Bree Jarrett, friend of mine who lives in a place called Dundas, Ontario in Canada, which is about, about an hour from, uh, from Toronto. Everybody knows Toronto in Canada. So um, this week, we're going to talk to Brie. Um, really uh, kind of excited to have her on the show. Um, she has, uh, from my perspective, from my circle of people I know, she has a kind of a unique, uh, uh, I think she has a pretty unique perspective on things, and she's a pretty unique uh, life perspective especially in the context of the current, you know, upheaval, racial tension, protests, killings, et cetera, et cetera, all the stuff that's going on in the world, especially in North America and around the world. And uh, I, I'm going to intro uh, Bree in. Hi, Bree. She's got her cat Hi, there as well. Helen. How are you? Great, great to talk to you. Happy um, Father's Day, by the you. way. Thank you very much. I know it's it was, a day late, but it uh, was. It was. It was a great father's day. I had a re really yeah. nice time. The weather was very, very hot, and uh, it was very nice. It was very nice. I really enjoyed it. Um, so I suppose we're, we're sitting here. You know, it's it's a middle, 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 or towards the end of June, uh, twenty twenty, and um, uh, you know, the world is kind of changing really drastically, quickly, drastically and quickly. And and yeah. I know you have some really, I I I think, and I'm pretty sure people will agree when they listen to the, the video on the podcast uh, and the video will be on YouTube and shared on Facebook and places like that. And the audio uh, podcast will be on Podbean, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, it's just a podcasting platform and I'll share all those links. But what I think is really interesting is, um, is, is your perspective on things. And um, why don't you uh, tell us who you are and tell us a little bit about your family and, you know, the unique, not, not unique, but the, the, the kind of the, what, what, what drives or informs your perspective? Um, yeah, well, I um, live in Dundas, Ontario, which is kind of interesting because Dundas has come under uh, yes, let's a touch on that in a uh, while. Yeah. Heat lately, um, yeah. and I have no idea whether it will be renamed or not. But uh, I've lived here for ten years. Um, I am from um, basically southern Ontario. My parents met and married in Goderich, Ontario, and um, my mom lived just a little north of uh, Goderich, northwest or northeast of Goderich. And, um, you know, so I'm from that area originally, uh, grew up in Caledon, Brampton, you know, I've lived in Toronto, Waterloo, Kitchener, um, and I've been in Dundas for the last 10 years. Um, I have three children, I'm a single mom, um, three children uh, with two different fathers, um, and they're all biracial. Now, my children are very um, fair-skinned, um, but uh, I have a 20-year-old daughter who, you know, even though she's quite fair, it's unmistakable that she is a, a, a biracial child, right? And um, she's had a lot of experiences living in very white towns like yes. Waterloo and, oh, I lived in Mississauga too. Um, and um, Dundas especially. I mean, it's funny, Dundas is a really interesting community um, because Hamilton is so close. Um, Hamilton's like the city. And, Hamilton's the nearest yeah, like big we're, city. We're like, yeah, it takes me two minutes to get up to McMaster University. Um, I'm just down the road from it. And uh, less than 10 minutes to get to the heart of downtown Hamilton, right? Um, so, but it's um, an interesting um, dynamic because Dundas is very, very white very, very white, but you go into Hamilton, there's a lot more diversity, but yes. um, it, it's an interesting place for me as a white person, I, you know, it's business as usual. Yep. However, I've had to really um, understand that for my daughter, um, so I have two daughters, one's uh, 20, one's 13, and I have a son who's 11, will be 12 this year. Um, and, uh, but it's my 20 year old that's really experienced a lot of racism and in, um, in, in this town and, you know, throughout her life as well, right? So, um, you know, she'll get things like, you're pretty, I mean, she's gorgeous. You've seen her, you know, <laughs> she's mm. beautiful. Yeah. Um, like supermodel beautiful, which, um, but, you know, she'll get comments like she's pretty for a black girl. Why not just pretty? Why yeah. not just pretty? 
Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, she's been outright called the N word. Mm. So has my other daughter. She's only 13. And it's even been used in my own home. So not, um, not by your family, just, just to, no, by a guest. Yeah. 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 Which is crazy. And, you know, regardless of whether it was intentionally meant to hurt or not, you know, you know, cause a lot of times people say, Oh, well, it's insulting. Well, is there any such like thing? That. Is there, I'm going to ask you on that point. Is there any such thing as casual racism or is it just racism? You know, I mean, do, well, do we I have to qual do we have to qualify as casual racism or subliminal racism? It's kind of, for me, it's just kind of, it's racism. I don't well, think I, I think that there's many, many different levels. I mean, I think you're hmm. definitely, um, you know, when we talk about concepts like white supremacy and white uh, privilege and white um, fragility and things hmm. like that, a lot of white people get their back up about that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but the, the word white supremacy really evokes the extreme, the white supremacist. Yes. But we live in a very systematic culture that has systematically been uh racist you yeah. know um because all the power is being with with caucasian yeah. uh, w w white people and that's well you can just look at uh, you know our population or that yeah. of the states yep. you know and all the people in power you know the presidents the prime ministers yep. you know they're all white all white yep. men and in the same pretty much across the board even though you may have some black people or some people yep. of color um it's very minimal especially in relationship to, I mean, I'm not a statistician or a probability expert, but I'm pretty sure if you, were to, if you were to take the population and yep. do statistics, probably there should have been more than one black president. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm just saying, yeah. or more yeah. people uh, uh, in positions of power. But, of power, yeah, exactly. I think the key yeah. is the word is power and influence. Where, where, where you, can, you can have power and influence is in, yeah. you know, deep, deep governments and stuff, civil service, that's health, right all those those uh, those those kind of seats of power i suppose so like i'm not a, a an expert on this by any means but um i have personal experience but i will say that there is a system of white supremacy um there are cer certainly your extremists and um you know there are people who um haven't had a very diverse life and you know want to yeah. protect their own world and see things as a threat. But I, I do think we have to acknowledge that there's been a certain amount of indoctrination in our um, schooling, in our culture. Um, you know, Jane Elliott, uh, she has been an educator for over 50 years. Yes. I'm pretty sure she's probably, you know, in her 80s because she started yeah. uh, doing the blue eyed, brown eyed yes. uh, experiments right after Martin Luther King died or wow. was shot, was shot and killed. Um, and she was a primary school teacher and it was filmed and she yeah. documented it and she's gone on to do that. But she says, we're living in this country, we're indoctrinated. Yes. And, you know, really you look at that the history is not taught. So there is embedded deep down, people do have prejudices and biases. And even though I have had relationships with black men, um, and I have children who are biracial or part black, you know, the world will see them as black, even, yep, I was even say if they're that. very yeah. fair, yeah. even though my children are very fair, but uh, they'll still be seen as black. Because they'll be put into that category for sure. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, and even that statement bothers me, you know, they'll mm -hmm. be seen as black yeah. because there's a negative connotation already. Yes. That straight statement away. bothers me so much. Straight away. Straight away. Yeah. Right off the bat. Um, I, one thing I want to talk about, you know, I mean, in my per personal experiences, again, I'm not an expert, but just to talk about some of my, well, I think, I, I think you are an expert in having biracial children <laughs> yeah, and having the experience of that. So that is yeah. your, uh, that is a, a unique, as I said, not unique perspective around the world, but it's, it's quite, it's, 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 it's a little bit unusual, which again is, is probably a testament to the fact that, you know, my, my, my circle is maybe is too, it's too white. <laughs> Why don't they know more? You know, you know what I mean? Like, so I'm going to self deprecate a little bit, but you know, yeah. I, th I think your perspective is, is really interesting because you're a mother of children and you have these challenges. And I think, uh, you know, um, I, I think I, I've definitely seen you posting about pre this, we'll call this, um, 
I, I don't know, this, this moment in history that's, that's kind yeah. of occurred, uh, triggered by, you know, I mean, it's always been there, but triggered by the George, uh, Floyd, George Floyd murder, killing yeah. and the murder. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's triggered um, something in you as well to kind of go, oh, well, hang on a second. Um, I, I, I haven't been, de- yourself, you haven't been de- dealing with it or, or, you know, facing up to people or maybe challenging uh, well, it seems I, I, like you've done, you've changed yourself, you've changed your own mindset and kind of. Well, I think that um, going back to what you're talking about is, you know, is everything racist and I'm saying there's different levels. Even me as a white person, having had relationships with black people or black men and um, I'm straight, <laughs> so only black mm. men <laughs> mm. yeah. and having biracial children. Yeah. But literally, even I have my own biases. And, um, you know, I've had many conversations, uh, one with a very good friend of mine, very in-depth conversations in which I was challenged a lot on those. And you, if I have them, everyone has them. That's crazy, yeah. You know what I mean? But if you admit to having them, that's even, like, it's amazing. You know, because you you could easily use your ticket and say, well, no, I have biracial children or or black children. a lot of people do. And yeah, people, you're even examining yourself saying, oh, I've got, I'm not, I'm not doing a good enough job here. I need to change my perspective as well. Yeah. Um, like Jane Elliott, uh, I posted one of her short videos and she basically to a crowd of white people said, um, raise your hand if you want to be black, you know, <laughs> if you want to experience what black people hand, experience, if you want to, if you want to be treated by society, how we treat black people is what she yeah, said. Yeah, exactly. And people, and nobody stood up. She said, the fact that nobody raises her hand says, you Absolutely. know, you know what's happening very plainly. You know, what's yeah. happening. You know, you don't want it for yourself. And yet you continue. To why are that. you so willing to accept yeah. that for others? Yes. Yes. And to, you know, allow it to continue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, in my experience, like how um, I, I would say before the George Floyd thing, you know, my daughter, was very, of course, you know, being a 20 year old, like their life experience is different. Yep. You know, they don't have a, uh, a whole lot of experience. And if you've had all these different microaggressions and, you know, micro assaults, you know, uh, oh, you're pretty for a black girl, kind of those types of things, um, as well as outright racism as well. And those build up as you're a child and they build up within you. Um, it's devastating, you know, and it's really affected my daughter um, hugely. And I think prior to the George Floyd, you know, I'd be the type of person to say, well, you know, brush it off and pull up your socks, get on with it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and don't worry about it without really truly um, understanding myself what the real um, or how this actually affects her. And, um, and that's something that I had to kind of come to face. I had apologized to her as well for it when I started to realize my own biases and my mm-hmm. own deeply entrenched um, um, beliefs. And yeah. even though outwardly, consciously, I didn't think of myself of course, as yeah. somebody who had I mean, those you, biases. You, you, want to, you want to be the best mother and the best parent yeah. you can be. Yeah, absolutely. But they're, they're insidious. And they're insidious because we have a culture um, that has... Um, continued this oppression for for hundreds and hundreds of years mm. and i was actually shocked that i didn't even know that canada had slavery mm. uh, something i've learned very recently which yeah. is shocking shocking yeah. that i don't know this yeah i mean we all know um about what how uh, indigenous people were treated in our country yeah. but even then i don't remember those things being taught in school yeah residential school you know? 60 scoop all of that yeah, yeah all that stuff the history yeah yeah and there's I, I a think, history yeah. and when you really look at um um the fact that you know black people were that means their identity of who who they are and brought to this country as slaves and that continues on for 300 years and then after that you've got vagrancy laws uh, um, where they're allowed to be um, just because they don't have a job they're allowed to be uh, thrown into jail and that slavery uh, continues really um, through the prison system 
Got it. And they're back on the plantations or they're mining or they're on the railroads doing indentured labor. Yeah. And when people finally get out of that or blacks finally were able to get out of it or stop, um, you've got the Jim Crow laws and then you've yeah. got redlining and you've got a great disparity where you know, um, access and wealth distribution has been greatly diminished. So I think I saw in a video somewhere, I think it was, um, anyway, I can't remember the video right offhand, but basically that the, the wheels have been greased for black pe or for white people mm. going up and the yeah. wheels for black people have been greased going down. Got it. That's a good, that's, that's a good, uh, good little analogy that kind yeah, of explains and, it. And I, I really think that when we look at, you know, you, you look at people who are adopted and their big question is, you know, where do I come from? Where yeah. do I come from? And we're, we may teach about the history of, um, you know, North America. And let's just say we teach it properly and we actually go through what um, the slavery and what actually the happened. laws and all mm -hmm. that. Mm. But are we teaching who black people are? The prior to this. Mm. And so there is this huge uh, prejudice and um, oppression against black people. And it's embedded even within them where they don't feel good about themselves, obviously, because they've constantly been subjected to this. And I think that's where people, white people don't get is they don't look at it deep enough. Mm. You know, they just always want to say, well, there's black on black crime and, you know, all this stuff. But when you look at well, what's the reasons why, you, you know, the good, good, good social studies people or people who study people and, and society. It's, it's, you know, you, 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 have, you can't just go on the surface and say, here's the statistics now it is. You have to kind of peel back and go, why? Even the justice system is supposed to do that as well. And policing and all of that. It's meant to figure out, well, why is this happening? Rather than just, you know, it's like, a, you know, I keep having a problem with, in my house. This is a, a, a simple analogy. You know, a, a power switch keeps tripping. Well, you just don't want to keep putting up the power power switch and say, no, it just keeps tripping. It's fine. Why is it tripping? There's something wrong. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's that, that machine is tripping and it might go on fire. You know what I mean? So it's like, you have to, you, don't yeah. be lazy and just keeps flicking the switch. Go and figure out, well, why is, we have a problem here. There's problems, there's rancor, there's, there's prejudice, there's drugs, there's whatever, there's horrible things happening in this section of society. But why is that happening? And you look, look back into, into, you know, systemic reasons for that over yeah. the years and and i just wanted to chime in on two different things you, you made me think about just to mention them on the podcast is um i just seen recently that um um the kind of i think the prime minister or the foreign minister of ghana in africa is now kind of saying come home <laughs> that we think it's great this is oh, your really? yeah, yeah this is really unique and i think it's really cool this much. is your like this is your ancestral home and if you ever want to come back to your ancestral home we will welcome you. So I thought that's kind of a unique perspective, right, you know, right. the African Americans who can like, well, they obviously yeah. came from, from Ghana or, or Africa. It's like, oh, you have an ancestor at home. And the other thing I wanted to just just uh, pop in here, and I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll make sure to um, put a link in in the in the comments or in the in the copy for the video, is basically I just listened to a podcast called Sixteen Nineteen, and this was uh, I think it's New York Times. Uh, I can't remember the lady's name. Um, your black lady, uh, a little bit of it is about horror history, but a lot of it is about history of kind of slavery. Um, yeah. You know, 1619, it refers to actually, um, you know, the time when a boat came to uh, North America, a ship, and it had 20, the first 20, they think the first 20 slaves. And it was kind of like, a, it was, it was a, not an accident, but it was like, oh, let's take these 20 people and as, as, as currency to, to, to buy something or whatever. And they, that was the first wave. And then the, the slavers realized, or people realized, oh, we can make money off the backs of human beings. And the horrible scourge of slavery, kind of the floodgates open for, for, for as, you, as you know, for hundreds of years. So that's one actually definitely you should, should listen to. But uh, I just wanted to add those couple of things in. Um, and that's about education. And I listened to the podcast for five, six episodes, and I was educated greatly about lots of stuff, Jim Crow laws, as you just said there. And the way the system was set up yeah. to grease on the way up, and uh, it's exactly that. So sorry, yeah, go ahead. I think it's really important to to mention that really, um, as I'm educating myself too, because I am no expert um, on history or um, of what has happened to Black people in our in our um, 
in North America, you know, in Canada, in the U S yeah. um, but I'm learning and, um, and I have a vested interest because I realize that this is a very serious issue. And when my son becomes a teenager, is he going to be seen mm. as a threat? And that's something that concerns mm. me greatly. And I've already seen, you know, the abuse that my daughter has gone through, my oldest, and, um, and even that my younger daughter is being exposed to as well. And so these things are very concerning for me. Um, so I do have a vested interest in, in learning about this, but yes. I also think that, um, well, I, I think it's really important to acknowledge that really, if you look at, you know, black, indigenous, people of color from all different races, really in North America, in Canada and the US, black people are really the only culture or the only race of people that have been so divorced and or, or taken, divorce is not the right word, but they've been ripped away from their ripped own away, culture, yeah, so yeah. their yes. own language, yes. their own, um, you know, knowing who their ancestors are. I know who my ancestors are. This is, on both this sides is of my point. family, both of my families came to Canada yep. on both sides of my mom and dad's family in the mid 1800s, like around yep. 1860s, right? Yep. So I know that. I can trace back. I know exactly where uh, my family comes from. And, but for people who were victims of slavery or brought over from Africa, yeah, they might know Africa, but do they know where they are from? And that's Do like saying help? people are from you like who who and that's a great point i never thought of this who would be happy and everybody has this innate desire to know where they came from right and this is why these yeah. ancestry.com dna uh, websites and stuff like that are so popular because people have an innate desire as you said to, where am i from where am i from but imagine just saying to somebody oh don't worry about it you're from that massive big land mass somewhere but don't, yeah, don't yeah, worry yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they should be happy with that and <laughs> exactly and so even if they were to remember who they're you know the first people that came over on boats and they were to know who their ancestors were but then there was such um cruel um you know, selling, you know, mm. taking people away from their splitting family families, splitting, splitting families. families. And, you know, so how does, how do these traditions continue? Mm. They're not allowed to read or write, you know, mm. these are oppressions. And mm. uh, I watched a Louis Farrakhan um, and I know he's very um, uh, controversial, you know, um, with regards to Malcolm X, but uh, one thing he said was that, um, Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. But, it's okay. Um, oh my gosh, what is there's it? A lot there's a lot sloshing around in your head. Well, I just wanted to say something. I'll just jump in maybe no, and help come back to me. let you recover your thought. But I think, um, you know, what's really um, interesting is um, that, and my, my actually, my daughter said this, my 20, 25 year old daughter, 26 year old daughter said, um, you know, so she's a, she's a, she's a Gen Xer, I, I suppose. But she said, you know, this is one of the biggest uh, educational and teaching moments in the history of the planet, yeah. and, which is true. And I think um, we all, you know, we all decry and kind of a lot of times if we have kids, we talk about the scourge of social media and how much time we waste and stuff like that. But from my, from my perspective, I think it's been, it's been a great tool to learn. And yeah. also to challenge, uh, just to learn, like just to educate and, and, yourself. You know? And we have to know that it actually really does affect all of us because yes. we've all been part of a system oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that has actively oppressed a whole, a whole race of people, um, uh, black people and indigenous people and, you know, people of color, but black people, especially who have come from these roots. And I remember now what he said, he was basically saying that there is an enormous amount of white guilt. Mm. and because they know they've been oppressed mm. they know they've oppressed black people yes but they also think but what if they're if they rise to power what if they do to us what we did to them and we don't want and, that well it, it's a it's a huge fear and yeah. because when, when you really think psychologically about the violence that is leveled against black people, it's unbelievable. And has been for really. hundreds of years. But they've gone through historically for hundreds, hundreds of years. and hundreds of years and it still continues. Yeah. And, um, but there, you can't be really understand why is there's this level of violence and the police. Yeah. And, you know, I know that some people say, um, oh, well, there's more white people. But if you take the population, 
percentage wise, it is always more black people percentage wise. Uh, you, always. Do, do you think, by yeah. Do you think there's um yeah, no, it's, it's, it's pro rata. Definitely. It's, it's, it's completely kind of skewed. Well, even indigenous before, you continue just uh, one statistic I saw recently indigenous population in Canada three percent wow uh, three percent of population I, I didn't even know that. in the prisons in 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 the prisons indigenous populations are 33 percent wow so that is a that is shocking that's so, shocking so, that like, is, that, that's I'm, not a, is, I'm not an you know, expert statistically yeah, happen, I was I gonna say that randomly, I'm not, you know? I'm not, I'm not an expert. Happen. Yeah, I'm not an expert in justice. I'm not an expert in incarceration. I'm not an expert in the prison system. So hands up. But for just yeah. from a, a, a lay person's kind of, you know, standing on the sidelines and looking down, kind of going, hmm, seems like there's something wrong here. You know, there's something wrong. I don't know what it is. And again, I'm not going to yeah. pretend that, oh, I can fix things. I, I can't. But there's something wrong. But when you when you talk about numbers like that, that's kind of, kind of shocking. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask you was uh, popped into my head when you were talking is that um, I, I, I have found in the past and, and, and kind of recently just looking at comments and talking to some people and stuff like that, but just looking at, at, at comments. For me, um, there seems to be a, a, an empathy deficit with, with, with a lot of white people. Um, there's a lack of empathy, right? It's kind of like for, for, for the struggles and for the you know, the, the, the horrible things that have happened to, to people of color for hundreds of years. And it's like, you know, um, on the extreme level, it's it's people online. Uh, and I just seen actually it popped up on my news feed that, you know, NASCAR um, said, obviously don't, you know, no more Confederate flags, right? Mm -hmm. And for them, it's like, whoo, good move, right? Because traditionally that would be seen as, you know, it's, it's a Southern thing and, you know, uh, traditional. And I just seen that one of the guys, I think Bobo Wallace, who was a white guy who, who, who said this is a great thing, he, they just found a noose. Somebody put a noose yes. in his, you know, it's just like, you know, yeah. uh, not, yeah. not good. The one black guy in the upper echelons of NASCAR. Exactly. So stick, let's stick, yeah. Garage. So let's, yeah, so let's, uh, let's, let's, you know, somebody's, uh, trying to incite fear, violence, bullying, the whole lot. Well, especially well, in the background that there have been about six lynchings exactly. that, that have yeah. almost immediately been labeled suicides. And well, I'm it's sinister. Saying, it's sinister. Psychologically, if I was a black person and wanted to commit suicide, probably hanging myself from a tree is probably the last thing that I would want to because do, how I'd want to kill of, myself. Yeah, because you of know what I mean? trauma associated, it, it, historical it, trauma. And, and the fact that so many of them are happening, like it, it just yeah, doesn't make I know. sense. It's, like, it's, it's a crazy time. But I, I, but what I feel is that there's, with, with some people, not, not all people, because, you know, I, I wouldn't label... I wouldn't label all people the same. It's it's a lazy way of uh, uh, you know talking about society in general. But I just feel that sometimes I, I can I can see kind of a lack of empathy. It's it's like some people just kind of gloss over and say, yeah yeah that guy was killed and that, that happened. Yeah, but well, come on, we should all just get on with it. You know, instead of pausing, kind of going deep dive and say, well hang on a second. And I think about that kind of a lot when I listen to these podcasts and mm -hmm. I kind of try and seek out information and I kind of think about people. Like you know, uh, in the 1700s, being brought over in ships, yeah. um, in chains, being captured in the jungle, sold, sold into slavery, leaving their families, leaving their mothers, fathers, traditions, uh, knowledge, medicine, where they live, the land they've lived for thousands and thousands of years, and then ending up in this place, which is just an, like an alien planet, and being sold for a year, and then that's like to think about that, to deeply think about that. And all of the, you know, that's not just, you know, thinking about the, the slaves brought over to the US, but there's then just the Canada and, and, and you know, the different aspects of that. But I definitely evokes feelings of empathy for me, which I can't even articulate, but where I, I kind of feel, you know, God, like how, how, how could you even survive? How can you keep living, uh, let alone, you know, have, having a family and you know how well, do you do, how do you do that like how well we have to really i i mean there is i think that's a complex thing um mm. going back to the jane elliott thing is you know it's happening mm. because you know you don't want it for yourself right yeah. you're aware of that you push even going aside. back to my daughter you know dealing with people who have you know said racist things basically yes um there's there was inside me in um 
you know, it, it takes a lot of courage to get up the nerve to confront somebody about that because you know you're confronting white supremacy and white privilege. And there is a, it, to me, it shows this lack of empathy, this silence, it shows that there is white privilege, there is white supremacy. And mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, a lot of people get caught up in those words, white people get caught up in those words. Um, and and think well, I I have black friends. Well, I'm not. A, have, the famous thing is, I'm not a racist. Right, I'm not a racist. And they have to realize that we live in a system that we have yeah. all uh, gained privilege from. You know, generationally, for hundreds of years, we've all been able to be in a system where we don't fear the cop pulling us over. We don't. Uh, we have the ability to buy a house wherever we want, and we don't have to de deal with racism on a daily basis. Mm. And there, what that says to me, the fact that we're so ignorant and lack empathy is that it shows that we do not listen to the voices of um, black, indigenous people of colors stories. And it, it's kind of like, I'll give you an example. I, I thought of this um, analogy um, last week and I thought it was uh, an interesting one where, um, you know, if you can imagine a boardroom, 10 people in the boardroom, nine people are white, one person is black, right? And as from the white perspective, you would think, well, we're being in inclusive. We've got a black person represented in our, maybe you have two, well, but we'll go with the one for now. And really the white people are patting themselves on the back. We're being inclusive, but we actually don't, really look at the perspective of how that person, first of all, often they're given the burden to speak as the spokesperson for their race, yeah. which, which is not heavy. as an individual, not That's as heavy. an individual, That's pretty heavy. right? Yeah. We're able to differentiate as white people that, oh, Joe, you know, Alan, you, you're speaking not for all white people, you're speaking for Alan. Bree yeah. is speaking for Bree. We're not speaking for the entire race, but no, yet anytime not. somebody black does kill somebody or does something or whatever, they're representing, you know, God, yeah, they're, they're suddenly representing the whole race. So there's, it's ridiculous there's, actually, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you're stress, right. right? Yeah. Also. So from the black person's perspective, and I can only imagine, um, I'm in rooms where I'm the one voice of dissent going, Hey, I don't agree with all you people. Like, let's talk about something else. And it's a very uncomfortable position. But now you add in all that history of hundreds of years of oppression. And that person has to, I, I mean, I don't think we give black people enough credit for how strong and um, amazing they are that they, I, I mean, if it's I constantly insane. got all it's this. Insane. yeah crap that they deal yeah. with on a daily basis i couldn't even imagine i think yeah, i'd go insane. out of my mind and yeah, i'd probably you know i can't i can't even contemplate it i can't right even, yeah, and yeah. we actually don't even think about it from their perspective and because there yeah. is this lack of of actually appreciating um black voices indigenous voices people of color yeah. voices we actually have to to make it our effort to actually seek out their voice first really and mm -hmm. this is like some of the things i didn't realize you know like i like to talk um you know and i found sometimes i talked over people you know and i'm thinking i'm it's just me you know i'm i'm, yeah. I'm having a conversation without really realizing the actual trauma you know that people have endured and are endure on a daily basis and you know i'm talking to my friend who's a person of color and i'm not appreciating how you know, what I think of as just as an intellectual debate is actually very traumatizing mm, mm. because it's much closer. And I think these are the things we need to understand. We actually need to think, what if this was our life? What if we were born out of slavery? Yeah. Our ancestors were slaves and they were denied. They went through Jim Crow laws and, yep. uh, you know, they were marginalized. They weren't allowed, you know. Had to, had to um, fight for their civil rights. You know, if, University yeah. segregation, the whole well, education, it's, it's crazy. like even fighting for education, it's crazy. you know, yeah. incredible. gerrymandering of so all of districts these things, for but votes. Give white people yeah. like privileges and take it away. And so black people often say we have to work four times as hard. Ten times harder, yeah. yeah. Ten times as hard, you know. So, yeah. And these are things we have to acknowledge. And yeah. anyway. So so I wanted to ask you a little uh, uh, for for um for a different perspective from for a moment and ask uh, just kind of go back to your your role your hat that you wear as a mother 
um, primarily as a mother and uh, as as a single parent as well, and a, a mother of you know of of biracial uh, or black children, wherever you you, you want to refer to your children as, but children of color. Um, and so, what are the kind of um, conversations or you know interactions you're having now? How do you navigate that with your kids? Because you've got like a twelve year old. Zoys is going to be tw- you know twelve becoming you know coming to an impressionable impressionable age of that 12 year old mm-hmm. uh, and you know Sonia is, is 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 you know is just coming into that really formative time and then you've got your other daughter who's gone through all of that at 20 and now she's gone into her you know her, her kind of adulthood what what how, how are you how are you navigating all of that and how, well, are, you to- how are you keeping it positive or do you keep it totally positive or are you no I think how do you keep actually- it real I think actually the first thing is to shut up and listen, really. Mm -hmm. That's a really important thing because and acknowledge that my reality is not her reality or their reality. And realizing first and foremost that that is the case, you know. Um, That's the number one thing. And then also standing up for them. You know, I think actions often speak louder than words, right? Yes. And having those difficult conversations with family members, with friends, yes. Yes. and really standing up for them. You know, we had an incident um, last week where a neighbor, you know, my daughter was coming home and my mom was pulling into the driveway. And so she had to go to the end of the street and somebody was a, a man, a big, tall, six foot man was kind of staring at her, not smiling, not waving, you know, yeah. <laughs> no, no friendly vibes whatsoever yeah. and yeah. watched her walk into the house. Now to me, that's like, well, maybe he didn't feel, you know, maybe he had something on his mind or what, you know, and this is what we do as white people. We make excuses for other white people's behavior. Right. And, but for her, that was devastating. Like it, 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 it she felt unsafe in her own home, Intimidated. in her own street. And she felt as a woman too, like, what am I, I'm a small girl. What am I going to do to a big six Mm. foot? So she was, she was actually intimidated. Very intimidated and, and felt watched. And that's a horrible feeling. And, but I didn't even realize like how deep that ran. I really had to listen. Anyway, we had an opportunity to talk to the neighbor and his wife and um, luckily they were very open to hearing what we had to say. And, um, you know, they had, it turned out that they had small kids and, um, and they are, they are open to these issues that are going on, especially the wife was. And, um, but you know, these are important conversations to have, but it could have very much been a different one, right? It could but you know, it's, you know, what's really interesting about that just from an outside perspective is I, I said at the beginning when I intro, <laughs> intro you or whatever it was that, you know, your, your style is to um, face up to things and talk and yeah. you, you believe in communicating and talking about things. You're not afraid of that. Well, you probably are afraid of it like anybody else. You, but you, yeah. overcome, you overcome your fears, right? You, it's not that you're not afraid. You're not, you know, you, you, you do, you do have to kind of fear and anxiety of that, but that micro that's called for me, you know, it's like a micro conversation. And if there was more of those micro conversations out in society um, and there's not enough of them going on, I don't know that. I just feel that. Um, that we let things go. I know go. they're not going on on Facebook because no. we, we, we let things go. Four hundred friends and we let things go. A yeah. very small percentage of them yeah. actually communicate exactly. in any yeah, way. Exactly. And, and, and people probably see stuff and they probably in in their mind some of them say, "Yeah, yeah, that, that's really good." But they don't pause and say, "I think that's a really good point." Or you know, they're just going to yeah, no, have a conversation gonna, about it. It's going right? to ghosting, right? And it's just yeah. a fear. It's yeah. a fear and anxiety of fate, as you said earlier. And facing up to that, oh yeah, this bad stuff really, really happened. It's real, right? So I think these those little micro micro interactions with people are very valuable. Like, and I think you know, if there was more of that, then it just be, that would become if that could become systemic in terms of having a quick chat and a conversation and clearing up, pr- probably um, clearing up. Uh, you know, just misunderstandings and nuances and different things where somebody might say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, and I'm not sure what happened in, in that instance, but we'll just say, for instance, I'm, I'm sorry for, for, for looking at the young lady um, in that way, and I shouldn't have done that. That was inappropriate. I find a lot of times with human beings, if you, if you, if you shine a light on something they've done, a lot of people are like, oh, shit, did I do that? I did that. I'm yeah. really sorry. And the fact that they can, you know, have some redemption, that's good for a person, I, I think, because yes. the next microsecond 
in their lives a week later, a month later, a year later, where they might their, their brain might be predisposed to kind of doing the same thing and staring somebody down, whatever. Something again, it's just a little, you know, a micro thought might go off yeah. and say, no, don't do that because you've done that and that you felt wrong about that. So don't do that. So I think those things are so valuable. I macro level, like big level yeah. government and all of that, but societal level, it's been able to have kind of conversations and not, not necessarily arguments because everyone has can have arguments about, you know, race and, and, and different things. And I, I suppose they're maybe useful in some way, but I, I think they're, they might be a bit, if I, if I have an argument with somebody, when I think about it, it's and probably it's probably a bit a little bit narcissistic of me. It's me wanting to beat that person in terms of my argument and with my facts about race or injustice or whatever it is. Whereas really that it's a little bit self-serving if I reflect on it. You know what I mean? I'm just like, oh, I won that battle. That's only one person. That's not really effective for my use of my energy or anybody's energy. That's my opinion. I feel what you know you're doing there is going to talk to somebody and then sharing it and sharing it here in this platform. Well, maybe. You know, and, and, you know, I get like three or 400 people listen to this podcast in some way. Well, that's great for me because 400 people will hear about that yeah. process you went through and yeah. the success. Yeah. For me, that's success. You, you've seen something happening. Uh, you felt there's a racial undertone to it. You addressed it and the person had a chance to kind of go, I'm not sure what they said. But I'm just, it didn't end badly. It didn't end like. No, you know, it, was a, it was a good conversation and we were. It was positive. It was positive. That, right. Yeah. And, and your daughter benefited from it as well. Yeah, and it was it was uh, it ended up being a really good conversation. But I've yeah. also had conversations that haven't been good. Absolutely, you know, where, right? absolutely, and, and that's but, and that's okay. That's that's but I will say, human being. I will say um, I prefer somebody to speak rather than not to speak. Not because no, silence can be uh, it's pervasive. Silence is the worst, worst it's thing, and insidious, as you said. It's just because you know yourself in anything in life. Silence is the vacuum, and then things are just infused into the silence by us well, ourselves. Yeah. Oh, what well, do we mean by that silence, you one know? Of, one of the main difficulties I think a lot of white people have um, is that um, when it comes to, you know, this issue right now, you know, obviously the George Floyd, we've had the protests, we've had looting, we've had all defund the police, all this stuff's been going on. But at the same level, there's also been going on in uh, equal measure is where um, white people are confronted with the concepts. It's not just about rallying against an injustice, but confronted with the concepts of white supremacy, white privilege, white fragility. Uh, we have to realize that as white people, we can walk away anytime we want. Black people can't. Oh. Have, black people can't never walk away that. from it. Yeah, never thought right? of that. Yeah, cool. You know, I, 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 I'm a single mom. And, um, you know, just to put this I find myself often when I have conversations with white people having to bring it to conversations of sexism or, you know, prejudice of some kind, even though it's not the same, yep, it is not the same. But I will say as a single mom, I've definitely felt the prejudice, you know, I live in a nice neighborhood, you know, and most people are married, you know, to dual income and I've had my struggles. Right. And, um, and there is definitely a prejudice in general towards single moms, you know, yes, and yeah. I find myself that's always in the back of my head, right? Talking with people and um, knowing that that exists, not that every person demonstrates that or, or reflects that, but you know, where we're in a very interesting uh, place that we're in is that you've got people who are finally kind of waking up to the reality of what's going on, but not, understanding it from the point of having experienced it of themselves course. of course right and at the same time black people and people of color and indigenous people they they are like okay we've only been doing this for our entire lives <laughs> and now you finally come to the party and great you're here but we're freaking tired you know what yeah, I mean? yeah, we're, like, exa we're well, tired. exhausted we're exhausted and we're fed up and so there's this dual issue and it's from my perspective anyway from my perspective you have people who are rallying for this want to be a part of the conversation but they're also confronted with his angst you know what i mean or you know this pushback so to speak um from blacks and from other people of color and indigenous people because they're like well we're here and they're like but it, it, to me it's almost like when you go through a healing process as well you have to speak your truth right and it's almost like this is 
on many levels, not that I'm a psychologist or anything, but, um, but having gone through many experiences, sometimes, you know, after the event, you know, hits a, a critical mass, you know, often you can go like almost seem to slide down, right, in terms of your emotions and people need to express themselves. And but what I find is there's a lot of walls from white people from hearing this. They don't mm. want to hear the experiences because they're like, we're here, you know. Well, what, what, does, like, what does anybody in life, uh, he, the human condition is everything's fine. Let's not change it. Everything's fine. Yeah, but, so, but we're narcissists. We're, we're actually very selfish. Yeah. Human beings are yeah. self-preservation. Everything's fine. Every, yeah. like, let's not rock the boat too much, right? And that, that's yeah. a big thing. And I think it's, it's you know, it's, it's, cha- it's, there's a big, big, huge seminal change kind of going on. But I think that's, that's human beings do that. They're like, well, oh, come on, like, can, can we not yeah. just, can we just keep doing things the way, because, you know, everybody's okay. Whereas you keep stopping and saying, no, this is from my white perspective. I'm yeah. trying to think of it from a, a black person's perspective, which is well, very hard to do. If, if we had walked in their shoes, exactly. we would be so traumatized. We'll never I'm know. Tell you. We'll never but we, know. Don't, we choose not to because, and I'm just speculating here, I think people choose not to because it's overwhelming. But yeah. white people have to understand that, like, even when it came to the George Floyd video, oh, sorry, cat. Sorry, the cat wants to come visit. Hello, That's cat. okay. Hello, cat. This is Jagger. But he's very skittish. Um, but uh, when it came to the George Floyd video, I could only watch half of it. Once he started calling for his mama, I lost it. You mm. know, mm. I, I Tra- couldn't. Traumatizing. I couldn't. But I had to go back and watch it in its entirety because that's the least I can do as a mm. white person. That's the least I can do yeah. because I don't face this trauma every day. And yeah. I find a lot of people are horrified. And then a lot of black people's response is, uh yeah well we only deal with this every day like mm. you know we don't want to hear about your feelings this is about yeah, our feelings yeah, yeah. Now, yeah right? your white your white fragility <laughs> <laughs> but then white people have a hard time accepting hearing that yeah, and being yeah. told no, what's wrong funny. yeah I, i'm telling you i'm sad about it I'm like what's yeah you know yeah. Well, why isn't that valuable why isn't there huge value to that well, yeah not and, really and well I, and know. we have to recognize that there is yeah. a lack of empathy and it's got very, very deep roots, yeah. you know, and I, I, think, I would yeah. suggest to people, you know, I post a lot of things on my Facebook feed about Jane Elliott because yes. it's coming from a white woman. Yes. And really, we should be listening to black people, really, yes. and people yes. of color and indigenous people. We should be listening more yes. and really trying to understand yeah. what they've gone through. Because I can tell you, like, I've been through a lot of stuff in my life and you know, it takes a lot of strength not to let that stuff, uh, you know, you, wear you down you, or kill you, you, you yeah, know, because, yeah. and, but when you're getting it just because like me walking down the street as a white woman, but I, I'm a single mom, maybe I'm struggling with things or whatever. Yes. Nobody knows that by the color of my skin. No. <laughs> That's yeah. the difference. That doesn't hang over you. That doesn't down, hang over you. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah. But a black person walks down the street. It's bingo. They could be like a like you know Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. You know, yeah. you could be astrophysicist. Uh, astrophysicist yeah, yeah, got it. But, you but don't all know. they see is he's black. Color. Yeah, you make, you make right. it. Right. And then big, a, big change. one other point I also want to make is, uh, you know, I've had some people say, "Oh, I hate where you know you're calling it white people and blah blah blah," but we have color. There's mm. nothing wrong with it. You know, mm. we all are different. You know, mm. we don't want to all be the same. You know, mm. we're men we're women we're tall we're short we're you know yes. we we have different characteristics we're young we're old you know yes. so all of these things actually are you know they people shouldn't get their panties so much in a bunch so to speak because yeah. you know stop making everything personal listen learn listen yeah. to stories. Well, learn is a big word i i totally agree it's learning and if you can learn like any of us in in life we sh- you know you stop learning uh, in anything and this is obviously really um important right now um if you stop learning you kind of stop evolving i suppose and you stop kind of living yeah you can't just stop oh i'm 40 years old i'm gonna stop learning you don't do that that's not what the way you know that's not a, a healthy way i, I think to, to kind of live your life you should always be open to learn and i think if yeah. and, and by learning you learn new things new concepts and then learning helps you to, educating yourself and learning about the past informs mm-hmm. your perspective our view of the current events and what's going on how, mm. and trying to understand it in a tiny way how, how black people 
uh, and people of color, indigenous people, how do you feel in a tiny way? Because I'm never going to profess that. Oh, I'm going to figure out how they feel. I'm never going to feel how they feel. Yeah. But if I can just try to increase my kind of, uh, you know, my empathy and try and increase my knowledge a bit, yeah. and I can't be, I can, I can't inform myself about race and race relations through experience because I've only got a white experience, which invariably is a privileged one. So I can't do it through experience. That's impossible because I'm white. But I can do it through education and by listening, as you said. And you said the first yeah. thing about your kids uh, when I asked you, and you said, the first, and it's great, great answer. So the first thing you do is kind of listen more, whereas maybe before, I think you said yourself, you didn't listen as much and you maybe yes. brushed, brushed some complaints from your even your daughter and probably yeah, in your head, yeah, in your head. I've done it. I've and probably it. in your head somewhere you were probably i think i just surmise you were probably on some occasions like ah oh, she's 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 making a big bigger deal than it is right or, oh well or and then you combine normal teenage stuff with it exactly. and you think that they're being exactly. over dramatic or whatever oh, it's dramatic. yeah yeah it's not but it's, it's not such a big deal or or did that really is. happen the way it happened you yeah know? exactly and and you said you apologized to your your 20 year old daughter because to. you were like many you times scratch your head and said wow i, I just because you now realize but that's education and that's a, a, oh, well, evolution <laughs> You know, it's funny. Um, so my daughter had a few dentist appointments uh, scheduled uh, just as lockdown kind of came about, right? Uh, timing, yeah. And, and they were going to be in the next week's course. Everything got canceled. So they recently called, said, okay, we've got, uh, you know, we're rescheduling the appointments. So I was driving with her um, and uh, we were talking. So we we're in the car because I had to take her to the dentist. And, uh, you know, I was saying some things and she corrected me. <laughs> <laughs> several times <laughs> in some of the words I said and your first thing is well that's not what I meant you know oh but I didn't mean that and 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 literally you know and I I would say well I'm trying you know I, I'm doing my best to be vocal yeah. and be out there yeah. because and she's like well I'm not going to give you a cookie for that <laughs> and it's like <laughs> those things are hard to hear right uh, yeah, but yeah, that you, is yeah, my yeah. privilege like we're used yeah. to being like well I can say what I want and, uh, and I'm trying yeah, I'm trying I'm trying I'm That's trying right. hard. We'll try harder. <laughs> yeah. And she's basically telling me when you say something a certain way, it makes me feel a different way. And I don't like it. Yeah. But That's I wasn't. You but should be aware of that. Viol- but here's the thing. In my daughter's case, you know, she's told me many times that, you know, somebody comes up and says, oh, you're pretty for a black girl or something I got. Right. You know, or um, says something about her hair or whatever. Um, you know, her response is generally thanks, you know, or just going quiet, right? Because for her to challenge it becomes a very, uh, now she gets labeled as aggressive. And we have to acknowledge that, that we have put people in a position, like I as a white person shouldn't be the one on this conversation. Like it should be somebody's black, that should be. But I am going to use this platform as a white person because I have that privilege to say the things that I want to say because I've had to pull my own self up by my bootstraps well, to be quite honest, it was many conversations that I've had and friends that loved me enough to take me to task for it mm. because I wasn't getting something. You know what I mean? And good friends. Uh, that's, that's a sign yeah, of a good friend. And, and I've had conversations with, you know, on different groups with people of color and listening and having conversations and having white people come back and, blah, 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 blah. you know, there's things like tone policing, you know, mm. where they're like, oh, well, uh, that's the thing I just recent. I knew it existed in some way, but there's uh, so much information on tone policing. But it's basically saying, well, if you just calm down, we'll we'll listen to you. Um, somebody recently put a post on uh, Facebook that said, basically, I don't care if you're black, brown, you know, short, fall, fat, tall, skinny. If you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. Mm. I don't know if you saw that on my Facebook. Yeah, I think I did actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's interesting. And I've heard people say that before and I find it really um, oversimplified. And it also puts somebody in the passive seat. Really, it truly it it's does. Also, it's also very akin to uh, the phrase all lives matter, which was now unacceptable. We all know that all lives matter. We've also always known that if you're a human being, a decent human being, all yeah. lives should always have mattered. That's not the point. We know that, push that to the side. What we're focusing on now is the lives that haven't mattered as much frankly this is black exactly. lives and that's what yeah. we're, we're now saying to people black lives matter because we know all those matter you know and i think that's yeah. that post was kind of like it felt like the same yeah thing. And, and basically just to sum up a lazy it's lazy people, 
you well, know. for people who didn't see it, I, I equated it, I used an analogy of having worked with the public in sales with people all my life. Now, let's say I work in a shop and I benefit off of people coming into my shop and buying product. That helps pay my wage. So I have a, uh, you know, I, I benefit from that, vested in, interest. Yeah, that yeah. transaction. So, you know, when I dealt with the public or I was in positions of serving people, you know, I took great pride, a lot of pride in being the one to make somebody else's day brighter, mm -hmm. you know, to make them happier and yeah. to enjoy themselves. But I, that's, I took that on as my responsibility. Yes. Ultimately, they're coming in as a guest into my place of business and I'm benefiting off this transaction. Now, I, I didn't do it just for solely because I benefited, because, but it is, was my responsibility. And what I noticed was a trend um, a lot of times I'd go into a shop or even in a grocery store and, you know, maybe you're just busy putting your stuff up, uh, on the grocery table. Right. And you get up to the cash register and you realize they haven't even said hi to you. So I've done that a few times, just purposely, not to more as an experiment, not to be like, um, nasty or anything, but just to see, okay, if I don't say anything, Go let on. me see what they'll say. Most often, people will be very, very, um, you know, terse with you. They'll um, say minimal words because I haven't gone out of the way to say, um, you know, hi first, right? And, or how are you, you know, and been the friendly person. But I would match people. And I did this a few times, you know, um, just to see what would happen. And it was really interesting that the you know, I kind of got labeled like the problem child, you know what I mean? Yeah. When yeah. really it was a very privileged place that they came from, that I'm coming in with my patronage to spend my money in your place of business, you're benefiting from it, and you can't even say hi to me, you know, yeah. smile at me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? And so I had to use this analogy in this particular post, and just to uh, reiterate it is basically I'll be nice to you if you're nice to me mm. whether you know and really the problem with that statement though is we as whites benefit in our society more mm. than black people do for instance and really it also puts them in the place where they have to do all the work they have to do all the work so yeah. it also means that they can't ever be upset or or um, hurt or angry or they can't be anything but nice mm. to in to enjoy the benefit of having empathy and yeah. um, and compassion and uh, understanding mm. and any other thing that we would normally give people oh you know oh are you having a bad day you know what's going on you want to talk about it you know or or That's maybe right. make a joke and make them feel better you know but immediately we associate you know, black hurt, black anger, black frustration as violence. Yes. And that is a problem. And so we have to understand that this, because I've heard it said so many times that uh, if I'm nice to you, if you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. Well, how about you be nice first? Mm. You know what I mean? Take the initiative. And, and, and continue being empathetic, continue being compassionate, because you've now you're going to educate yourself about the history that black people in this country and the U.S. have gone through and indigenous people and people of color. Um, you know, we <laughs> we really have to begin to take responsibility and understand that, you know, they might not always be nice, you know, mm. and, but most people. But that's part of the healing process. Mm. They have to get it out. Yeah. And there's one other thing I just want to say very quickly. I saw one person said on a post, you know, um, I haven't said too much because I don't want to talk about problems until we can talk about solutions. Right. Mm. And, you know, this is from somebody I respect very much. And uh, but it is sort of a fallacy of sorts because all conversation is not about solutions. Mm. Conversation can be for connecting. Conversation can be for healing. Conversation. It's probably a little bit diversionary. It's like let's just push it to the side until we can. Yeah, you're right. There's no such thing as a conversation that complete or immediately introduces a solution. Conversations no. are conversations are a constituent exploring. part of of finding solutions. They can Have be exploring. They can be right. just venting. They can be, um, you know, sometimes Educating, you just need to talk to somebody yeah. about your feelings that you've gone through. They are all about solutions. No, and no. we have to understand that that when yeah. we are 
looking at this black white issue, you know, in our country and really, you know, I, I say black indigenous people of color, but really black people, black lives matter makes it, it it's really important because they haven't mattered. Hmm. In fact, they've been systematic. Like even you look at the dr war on drugs in the eighties and nineties, you know, uh, budgets went, you know, tripled hmm. and, and drug use became criminalized. And hmm. it's like, you know, for the statistics are like one in 112 people, white, or white people are going to go to jail, but it's like more like one in 14 mm, for gotcha. black people. Yeah. That's a huge discrepancy, right? Oh, that's crazy. And so yeah. again, you know, you've got people who are dealing with issues where they haven't been able to build up wealth and they're dealing with poverty or lack of opportunity or lack of education. And, um, you know, and then you want to criminalize that behavior. So it's just been a systemic thing that mm. I just mentioned that because it's something I meant to mention before. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's just, it's quick. It, it can be quite circular, you know, just a yes. circular system, you know. So we have to really acknowledge that these things have happened. They're in our history. They mm. are. Big and, um, you know, and now like just to circle back, we started, I'm in Dundas, Ontario, yeah, yeah. which is now under fire. You know, yeah. I know a lot of people are really upset about the concept. And I mean, for me, you know, I like the name Dundas. Like, you know, I've, I've been here 10 years. You know, it'd be kind of sad to see it go. But at the same time, when you understand that this person was instrumental in delaying the end of the abolition of slavery for 15 years. And, and that if, affected... And if, and if like, a, a, you know, a, a, we'll call it decent or, or normal thinking you, human being, you agree that slavery was an abhorrent you know, kind of travesty on, on, on yeah. black people. If you agree with that, that basic tenant, well then, you know, oh, these, these things aren't as important. And it well, must be, it, you know, and, and, and even all of these, you know, statues and stuff like that, a lot of white privilege will be saying, well, you know, you can't erase history. That's absolutely correct. You cannot erase history. But I'll tell you what you can do. You can, you can in, in Charlottesville, or I can't remember where exactly it was in the States, but you can take from the pavement as a city you can dig up the concrete stump that they used to sell slaves on that's been on a, a street corner for the last wow. hundreds of years wow. uh, about two, two months ago we're going to dig that up <laughs> and get rid of it now if you're walking past that as a black person every day to work or every day to the store and you look you know, yeah, no. I'm like, if I, I, my name's, you know, Alan Carroll. And if I'm looking and kind of going from a selfish perspective, oh, that's a stump where my great, great, great grandfather was, was bought and sold. And that's a really beautiful. important thing right? because what you How say. How painful is that? I had an experience where I lived in Toronto in my early 20s, or not in Toronto, um, Kitchener Waterloo in my early 20s. And I had some bad experiences there, okay? You know, it's your 20s, right? Your early 20s wasn't the greatest experiences. And so I moved to Toronto and, you know, eventually got married, had my, my oldest daughter, and then I moved back to Waterloo. But prior to moving back, Waterloo and Kitchener were like a big giant black X mark in my brain because I, I had a lot of mixed feelings about some of the experiences I had there, right, you know? And, uh, but I moved back. Um, you know, and it, what's interesting, I stayed for like about seven years. And what's interesting is I created new memories. Mm. Okay. But never forget the old No, memory. of course not. No, never, that's ever. For, the, yeah. the, on an, almost a daily basis, I'd be yeah. driving by and, and something. Triggers. You know, They're called triggers. The trigger, exactly. right? So it's just the same, like, you know, uh, and that's your own personal experience. And if yes. you amplify that to being a societal experience exactly. or, or an experience against the whole race, not not just That's you, right. not just Bridger, because right. you live in your own little, we all live in our own That's little right. planets in our mind, and we think the world revolves around us. But if you're, passing, then, if you're passing by, you know, um, a, a statue of a, a Confederate general who fought against the abolition of slavery, well, that's kind of offensive. And, you, you know, you, you not kind of offensive, it is offensive. And you don't want, you, you, it's not fair or equitable or humane to be constantly reminded of that and have to, and even statues by their very nature, what do they do? They laud people. They, they put people yeah. literally yeah. up on a pedestal. So you're saying, ah, let's forget, and, you know, you could, oh, but they did great stuff. They did this, they did that. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. You know, lots of, lots of criminals and people who did horrible things in life also did, you know, 
maybe helped an old lady across the road every now and again. So, yeah. you know, you, you, it's, it's, you've got to be judged by your actions, all of your actions. Well, I mean, right? it's such a history of such horrific, it's of, horrific. justice. It's horrific. And, and, Lack of justice, and, yeah. and horrible um, yeah. atrocities against, yeah you know, a human being, a human mm. being. I mean, too many you know, to even, it's just, yeah, it's just overwhelming and, when you, when you exactly. dig into it, you know? And to continue to have these things. So, you know, it's but, a big change. It's a big, it's a big, yeah. it's a bit, I mean, I, I, from my perspective, you know, I, I you know, you, you, you hear the word change is, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a malleable word. It can be big change, small change, whatever. But when you, when, when you have the defense secretary Esper in the States, and uh, I think the, the, the general the joint chiefs of staff, Millie, saying oh well these 10 10 uh, military bases we have were, were open to changing the names and they say that very early they and i'm not extolling the virtues of these people by any, any uh, uh, stretch of the imagination but i'm just observing their what they're saying and when they come out to represent the army in the states which is a big thing to say we're open to changing all of these names because a lot of these a lot of these yes bases like were named Fort after for like bride confederate generals yeah. who fought yeah. against the United States Army, <laughs> but we got it, and fought against the abolition of, of one of the big things was the abolition of slavery because slavery was. About Did you just money. give me the finger? Did no. you just give me the finger? <laughs> <laughs> finger. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. But they fought, yeah, they fought. They're trying against. to be funny. Trying no, to be funny. when I stop the video, I'll, I'll do that. No, I'm joking. But they, you know, they, so they fought against their slavery, which was all about money and, and all about even people's, um, people's, uh, uh, people's flesh, people's black yeah. flesh was, was the currency, right? But yeah. I want to encourage you and, and anybody who's listening to listen to that, that 1619 podcast. And I, I think um, what I wanted to kind of do to wrap up to say, as I suspected, it's been a very informative discussion. And I just really hope people get kind of, you know, some, some, a little bit of education from you, from your perspective as, as a mother of children of co color, there's a perspective there. It's been a, like the way I, I think it's really great to talk to somebody like you because you're, you, you know, you're not sitting there saying, well, I'm all, I've always been well-informed well educated wow. i've always worked in it and you know i've always do, done everything correct in relation to race to my children you're you're mature enough and, and intelligent enough and, and you know compassionate enough and empathetic enough to prop your hands and say hmm i haven't i've, I've done some things really i forgot i haven't played this right in, in, in you know in relation to my own children that's it. and they're your own children so you're you're brave enough to say hmm i gotta change so if you like you know yep. uh, can, can do and, that Every, anybody can do that. It's really important to understand too, like I told you, you know, I've had relationships, it was funny, like I've had friends who say, oh, Brie likes black guys. Well, actually, no, I've dated actually probably equal amounts, black guys and white guys. Yeah. But you do get start to get an education. And I think why I chose to have children with black men, not white men, though even though I've dated pretty much half and half, um, is because you start meeting the family and you feel the prejudice, you feel the racism and your mind starts to open up, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I would say for the last 30 years, I have had people, um, you know, especially my relationships didn't necessarily end up with, you know, you know, happily ever after, but, yep. um, you know, and sometimes I think, you know, they did things that were kind of, you know, not so nice, but anyway, but I find people would often say, oh, oh, he's a black guy. He's a black mm, guy. Interesting. Right? And I've been, I've been dealing with that for about interesting, in interesting. my life. Should have, and, should have known, Bray, he's a black guy. Yeah. And you know what? As, it's a terrible uh, thing to say. It's as a person who tries to. It's a terrible to, thing to say. It, it, it's horrible. And, but I still wasn't experiencing racism directly towards me. Oh. You know, I, I'm witness, I'm being, as a white person, I'm only witnessing it. Yes. But yes. I've experienced that. Um, and one thing I wanted to just say in closing is that, um, you know, like with regards to that situation, I tried to take responsibility for my own actions. And I think that, you know, with the issues that I had in my life, I probably would have attracted a very similar type of person, whether they're white or black, Doesn't right? Matter. So yeah, I exactly. have to take responsibility for my yeah. own actions. And I've never seen it because, oh, that's, you know, uh, equality for black people, right? You know, yeah. it's, and, and we really, I think what I want to say is that I think we really need to understand that, um, you know, there's a lot going on and we have to, if we're interested in being part of the conversation, uh, that we have to actually explore a little bit more 
Uh, we have to educate ourselves. Yep. We have to do a lot more listening. Yep. And that it is a very complex issue. It's yep. not about, It's you not know, simple. It's not simple. I know some people are just like, their whole focus is whether it be the statues or it's defining. No, it's not statues. simple. It's complex. And, and they just want it's to focus on that. And it's no. not. A and it's a long process as well. Or on the politics of things. And it's not simple. No. And, um, you know, and we have to really make a concerted effort to understand that we have all been a part of this system. Even, well, just in cozy, I'd like to just say this. Um, how many times, you know, people say like, you know, do you have any black friends? Do you have any people of color in your life? You know, uh, but have you ever been to their home mm, for dinner? Because the white privilege is they, you know, we invite them to our house, but do we go mm. into there? And I think a lot of people, a lot of people I, I, I can see, uh, I won't make sweeping statements, but I'll just make uh, observational statements. There's, there's a kind of a tokenism about, um, I know, I know. You know, it's a kind of a common yeah. trope uh, white, white, white people use. And it's, just, it's all about guilt, really. I think you said it earlier. It's all about guilt. It's an inherent guilt we have somewhere in our minds. We know that oh, we, 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 we haven't stood up to this and we haven't spoken out. And it's about, uh, well, I'm not racist, first of all, because nobody likes being called racist. No. Um, well, well, most people. <laughs> and, uh, and then it's like, I, I mean, I, I, have, I have black friends or I know black, I know black people. And then uh, I seen somebody online saying, okay, next question should be, what's their names? Okay, blah, blah, blah. Do you know their wife or their husband? Have they got kids? Where do they live? Have you ever been to their house? Have you ever had them over to your house? <laughs> and it kind of it falls off generally, not saying, again, I'm not generalizing, but it kind of falls off the cliff a bit. So that yeah, kind of... Yeah. I know black people, you know, it's just, it's such a, yeah. it's such a facile uh, way of kind of responding. It's, it's, it's Well, even empty. just going back to the concept of you said, don't, you know, we can't erase history. No. But the fact is we actually don't even really know the no, history. No, exactly. Right? That's a very good, that's a very, I like that point. It's, uh, it's right? back to, well, before you even go anywhere, stop, get online, it's never been easier and educate yourself understand the history black people to do understand. the work for because Correct. black people have done enough free labor in this country yeah, exactly in, in the u.s go and do it yourself yeah, yeah. Go, go go and do, do some heavy lifting get a shovel friend, you know dig and and the google's your friend right it's, yeah, yeah no it's, as i said there's podcasts there's yeah. videos there's you know really really rich historical data out there it's out there and uh you know we, we've all just seen the homogenized version of it over the years the whitewashed yeah. version to, to you know give an exact uh, what's really happened and uh, I, I always want to be educated I, I'm not a person yeah. I like to I like to be informed I'm that type of person you know me like yourself I, I just like to know stuff right and I want to know what happened and I want to know um, the ins and outs of things so I've been educating myself I've been going away and saying well what happened here and what happened there and, you know and yeah. it's shocking <laughs> to be honest it's traumatizing but who am I to be even traumatized and shocked because I'm, I'm white exactly. it didn't happen to me or it didn't, it didn't happen, happen to my to grandfather or my great grandfather, you know, it's, it's, and, but it's mind blowing. It's, and the only thing is white people were being asked to do is acknowledge words like white supremacy, yeah. white privilege, white fragility. Yeah. And get yourself up and, to speed, get and, yourself and, up to speed. To but get, even get people have a hard time acknowledging those because they take it very personally, but it is the system that we're in and we have to acknowledge it. And in most of it's it. systemic. I think most people have good intentions. Majority of people do, but we have a habitual way we've been taught and raised. It's the way the system different. is set up. It's the, the way the system has been set up. We don't know until we know, right? Correct. It's like, you know, husband and wife, you know, talking. Correct. Like, you know, and he says something out of, you know, upsets her or vice versa, but right? He doesn't, but he you doesn't know, know or she doesn't know. You have to say, hey, that upset me. Oh, did it really? And then, then you kind of figure it out. You're going to go, right, I'm, going to be, I'm not going to say that again. Yeah, and that's learning. It's back to your neighbor. Yeah, same thing. Your neighbor... Time. Labor, yes. looking at your peering or whatever just intimidating yeah. that and as i said for me it's it's about kind of like micro moments like this micro moments of change are very valuable yeah. for that person to, to and maybe that per, and maybe that guy or, or whoever your neighbor or whoever it was and um, might might tell somebody that story and say oh you know oh, this just happened to me and this is what i did and now i yeah. understand that was and even that like has it has an effect and as i said us, us talking about it here is it's kind of, it's really um it's really valuable yeah. and i hope i hope people you know um get get um you know just are inspired i suppose from what you've said in relation to um you know your experiences as a as a, as a white mother um of uh, children of color uh, i think it's been a great perspective and uh, i'm I'm, uh, I'm really happy to have uh, 
to have had this chat. It's been wonderful. Yeah, it was great. You know, Would you and your cat. We need <laughs> my cat. Yes, Jagger, we Jagger the cat. Educate ourselves. Um, mm. There's lots of resources. Never stop. Never there. stop. Never stop. Um, but you know, also remember, like as much as I'm saying all this. You know, I live in a very nice neighborhood, white yep. neighborhood. Um, my friend in Toronto, you know, she's got a big Black Lives Matter sign. Mm. I'm hesitant to put that up in my neighborhood. So I've got work to do. We all have work to do. It's like yeah. peeling an onion, you know, yeah. and we have to just keep Many working. layers. Yeah, I like that. You know? That's a little, I, that scares me to yeah. put, you know, yeah. uh, that up on my, because now I'm really, you know, making a stand. Mm. And, but really... I need to do something like that, mm. right? Mm. I need to actually, but you know, there's this, I just want to mention this one last thing is that, you know, white people have that ability. Like if somebody meets me, just me, they don't know my kids, they don't know my mm. history. I often been treated very differently mm. from when they know that I have black children or have had relationships That's with so black That's so interesting. Men. That's so interesting. You know, and, and we have to acknowledge these things. It's like me putting that sign out, you know, I'd be, basically saying this is yeah and it's confrontational to a lot of white people we have to ask ourselves why you know yeah, yeah. and and if that if anybody takes anything from that is just you know have the courage to talk you know mm. and even if it's not right don't be afraid of making mistakes and even if it's uncomfortable and 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 learn words like wow i never thought of it like that before or hmm that's something that's a new perspective or no I, yeah you know Instead yeah. of always this need to be right and, and to convince other people of your truth, like this is going to be, this is a much more complex issue than a husband and wife not understanding each other. This is a very deep and complex issue. And even if we don't have any black friends or black people in our lives, it affects everybody. And we're yeah. going to have a better world when we deal yeah. with these issues and we heal. I'm, I believe so. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> I could probably that's keep been on amazing. Talking. That's been amazing. Well, that's been amazing to talk to you, Bree Jarrett. Yeah, uh, exactly. And done this. And um, yeah, so uh, as I said, if you're watching the video, you can catch the you can catch the podcast on Podbean. I'll 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 uh, I'll put all the links down down below. And uh, it's been great to chat to you. Thanks for your time. Very lovely talking and, to you. As well. And here's here's the next time. All right. We'll Take care. Later. Bye. Yeah. Bye.